is a joint meeting between the um, uh, Community Development Block Grant Committee and the Mental Health Board. And it's wonderful to have everybody here. And I'm thinking to start off, why don't we go around and each introduce each other, ourselves, and say which committee you're on and maybe why you're on there. I'm Ann Rainey, I'm the Alderman of the Eighth Ward and I am just found out yesterday I'm chairing this committee. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for the late notice. Um, all right, so I'm, let's, I'm gonna go this way. Um, all right, so um, Derek. Hi, thanks, Sam. Hey, everybody. My name is Derek Ohanian. I'm a resident of the third ward, yeah. and I am on the Housing and Community Development Act committee because I really care about equity throughout kind of our economic development within the city and also access to dignified housing. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Sarah, could you call people because people keep moving around and you're managing this? Sure. Um, Irene. Irene. Yes, hi. Pardon the um, the color in this. My my camera here today is weird, but I'm with the mental health board. Have been on it for about six years now, and um, very involved. I'm a social worker um, by training, and still involved in that professionally. And have done a lot of work with persons with um, mental concerns, mental illness, and um, mental health issues. And so that's where a lot of my commitment comes from. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ugo. Thank you, Sarah. Hugo Rodriguez. I am also a resident um, of the Eighth Ward and uh, proud to be a, a, an Evanstonian for the last almost 20 years now. Uh, I love the community. I love to serve uh, in this committee and hopefully uh, with time make a difference to benefit the less fortunate in, within our communities. Um, Arcana, did I get that right? Arcana. Archna. Archna. Like I'm sorry. Archna. I apologize. No, no worries. That's fine. Uh, my name is Archna. I've been on the mental health board for about a year now. So a little over a year, actually. Um, I started through as part of Nathan, who I'm not seeing here right now. Um, I'm a psych psychiatric nurse and presently I'm in school for my psych mental health nurse practitioner. So I'm hoping to be more involved in the mental health needs and development in Evanston community. And would you tell everybody what you did this morning? Um, I'm doing my clinicals. So I was via Zoom, we were seeing patients with my preceptor who is a psych nurse practitioner. So we were all on Zoom doing patient care via that. Oh, so so you're, when are you going to um, get your, is, is it a degree? It's a degree, right? And it's a degree. Is it a, and then I have to sit for my license, okay, which I'm so hoping when, to. When will that be? The practitioner? Hopefully by middle of this year. Because okay. everything has to be submitted to the credentialing community and then set for the license exam. So it has crossed. Very impressive. We're all rooting Thank you. for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for serving on this committee. It must really add to your load. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, thanks. Alderman Lynn. I'm, mental health I'm just trying to keep us going. Okay. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, Melissa Wynn. I'm the alderman for the third ward. Um, I'm, I've been serving on this committee for the last three years, three years, yes. Um, traditionally, uh, all of the aldermen who have um, target areas, CDBG target areas in their ward serve on this committee, and that usually fills up all of the spots. The third ward doesn't have any of the target area in it, so uh, there was an aldermanic seat available at the beginning of this council and I was very excited to be able to sit on CDBG because I've always been really interested in the subject. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and I'm really interested in the changes that we're making um, this year uh, and, and, and to see how, they, how this rolls out. Thank you. Um, Sandy Johnson. Yes. Sandy Johnson. I live in the uh, first ward at this point, 
and um, I'm on the, I've been on the mental health board for about seven and a half years right now, and I was trained as a clinical social worker. Hey, Sandy. Alderman Wilson. Thank you. I'm Don Wilson. I'm the alderman in the fourth ward. Uh, I won't uh, have everybody listen to my 12 years of reasons for doing this, but generally speaking, uh, I like participating in this committee, and I have been the entire time I've been on the council, uh, because we do support a wide variety of needs in the community, and I also feel like it helps me stay dialed into what those what those needs in the community are. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Good evening, I'm Robin. I'm the Alderman in the fifth ward, and we do have an impact area. Um, I have been on the committee for four years, and I enjoyed um, traditional programming that might have been funded by CDBG type dollars um, in my upbringing. I'm a product of family focused pro programming, and um, they are one of the organizations that we generally support. So happy to be here. Um, Becky Filer. Hi, um, I'm Becky and I am in the third ward and I have been on the mental health board for three years and I'm an LCSW and I currently work in various nursing homes through a company called Impact Healthcare, um, providing therapy. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. I think that's everybody on our board, uh, boards or commission that are here. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Don Wilson, Alderman Wilson, will you uh, move to suspend the rules and read the governor's uh, thing? Yes, thank you. I move that we suspend the rules to allow us to proceed with this meeting utilizing the Zoom video conference software in lieu of an in-person meeting and in accordance with the governor's prior directives related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Second. And I can call the roll for this. Yes. <laughs> um, Alderman Rainey. Aye. Uh, Derek. Aye. Irene. Aye. Hugo. Aye. Arcana. I'm sorry, I keep screwing up your name. Akna. I Archna. Archna. Oh, like I'm Archie. so sorry. No, that's fine. I am so sorry. Alderman Wynn. Aye. Mm -hmm. Andy Johnson. Aye. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Aye. And Becky Filer. Aye. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, so the first item on our agenda is public comment. Last I heard, we have no one signed up for public comment. Has that changed? That has, has not changed, but we do have six people in the waiting room and one hand up. So with the permission okay. of our uh, body, I would like to invite people to attend and then I can reassign them as panelists, or uh, I'm sorry, as participants. If there are no objections, and I'm sure there are none, um, yes, please invite all of our guests in. And if if there are any people who did not realize I had to sign up, please invite them to speak and get their names. Okay. Hi, uh, this is Tina Payton. Hi, I hope everyone's well. Um, so I, uh, I don't think it was this meeting, one of the meetings, but the, uh, Sarah, you said that um, you were going to see if the, there is some CDBG funding that was possibly used or could be used for uh, rapid rehousing. I think you said it was 50,000 or 55,000 or something um, to, to be used for rapid rehousing. Um, I wanted to know if there was any update on that. And then, um, so I wasn't quite clear. Um, uh, the city manager said at one time that the $500,000 that was um, given, you know, to help the landlords, uh, she said that 50,000 would be used uh, to help landlords repair their property. Is that true or 
what's the deal with that? So I just had those couple of questions. Um, Alderman Rainey, would you like me to address them or would you like oh, yes, me to? Yes, please. Okay. Would you, for some who might not know what Tina was speaking of, would you explain the 500,000? Sure. Um, so um, let me first uh, address the question about the money for rapid rehousing. Um, it wasn't, it's not CDBG um, CV. It is actually, we have some ESG CV, which can be used for rapid rehousing and can be used for prevention funding. Now we've allocated $50,000 um, for prevention funding, which is to help people who are in housing, but who can't pay. Um, rapid rehousing is what we use to put people who are homeless into housing. So just so everybody understands the difference. Um, the, there is need for more prevention money than our 500,000 or anything else to tell you the truth. And we the reason we were thinking of seeing if we should move it to rapid rehousing is during the um, um, eviction moratorium um, with ESG prevention money, a tenant has to have an eviction notice in order to be eligible for prevention money. And so HUD says you can't use it because people can't file eviction notices because all of these tenants have to be under 50% of area median so they'd be eligible. But we also learned that Chicago got a waiver to that. And so we are trying to find out if we can use that waiver and be able to use the funding for prevention. Um, one of the things about ESG prevention funding is it can help a um, tenants for a much longer period of time than the $500,000 of CDBG funding, CDBG CV funding that is being used. Um, so CDBG CV can be used for only up to six months of assistance for rent assistance. And ESG can actually technically be up to 24 months. I don't think we've ever used it for that long, but, but it really can help bridge people who, um, need more than three or six or some of the shorter term subsidies. So that's how it's been used historically. Um, so we are really trying to find out if we can use that Chicago waiver. Uh, if we can't use that Chicago waiver because the moratorium seems to be being extended time and time and time again, then we will come back to council and recommend that we switch it to rapid rehousing. But we're trying to take care of that one thing. Um, about the city manager saying of that 500,000, 50,000 was for repairs. I, I'm not aware of that, um, uh, of, of the city manager saying anything about that. Um, it is not a, it's not how any of the money is allocated. Um, of that 500,000, 450,000 is allocated for direct assistance. In other words, rent assistance that goes to landlords. And up to 50000 is allocated for connections to use for staffing costs. Um, obviously, when you're running a program like this, you have to do intake, you have to do case management, and there is a lot of financial management. And so they have to have the ability to implement the program. Um, so that's what the other 50000 is for. Well, that's what I thought. And um and I said that, and when she said that at one of the other ward meetings, I was confused about it. Can I ask a, another question? How many okay. people are still at the hotel and what is the plan for that? And are you taking any more people at the hotel and what hotel is that? Well, I can address some of that. I don't know the exact number, but last I heard it was about 70. Um, and, um, there are different people there who need different um, types of subsidies and assistance. Um, and so some are actually in the queue for permanent supportive housing, for example. Some um, are, uh, will be eligible or could be housed with rapid rehousing or something like that if we get more of those funds. And there can be rapid rehousing funding that comes through the city. There can also be rapid rehousing funding that comes from the county or through the continuum of care. So there are multiple sources for this. So 
anybody um, on that it, in the hotel is on the um, waiting list, if you will, for different of those sorts of funding uh, sources through the continuum of care. It's kind of complicated and, you know, quite frankly, there aren't enough resources fast enough for all the needs. So it's really to prioritize the people with the needs, um, uh, the deepest need to get them to the services they need as quickly as possible. But it isn't as quick as it should be. <laughs> Thank you, Tina, for your questions. Are there any more people in the, um, in the waiting for questions? So all attendees have permission to, they should be able to talk at this point. Right. So if there right. are any hands up, please. All right, if there are any hands up, fine. Okay. If not, let's move on. We have um, a lot I'm of I'm sorry, we do have one question from the committee. Okay. Right, and the question is, since these funds are CDBG funds, are those uh, disbursements to rent aid, uh, following the guidelines of the CDBG funds that we have for any other uh, monies that we use? Not exactly. This is CDBG CV through the CARES Act. They made a bunch of changes specifically. Um, they used, the federal government used CDBG as a mechanism to get money out to a lot of communities that um, who they figured would need help. Um, because all of the population, all of the communities that get CDBG, and it's about twelve, um, about twelve hundred nationwide, um, have low and moderate income populations that are that qualify for it. But they made some changes to the regulations for this C CDBG CV money. So it, it's normally with CDBG, we would not be able to do rent assistance for six months. We could perhaps do rent assistance for three months, but it's not a very effective mechanism for it. And I got to tell you, there's some really annoying things like um, the way uh, it, it doesn't fit. CDBG is first and foremost, a, a, um, was designed as a bricks and sticks, um, you know, community uh, uh, development uh, source of funding. And so a lot of times the way it works for services is not as flexible as a lot of the other grants. So that's why we don't, we don't normally use it for, for um, rent assistance. If I have a follow up on that. Sorry, Anne, if I, if I may. No, and it ahead. is, thank you. And it is that, um, you know, my concern is that this funds then get allocated to areas that are not CDBG uh, elected or uh, conforming. Mm -hmm. um, I'm concerned that this money is then because they're under a bigger umbrella that will go to landlords that have more funds than uh, the, the landlords that uh, are within the, the CDBG uh, areas that we have already designated in Evanston. That, that would be my concern with that, uh, Sarah. Well, CDBG, when you're using it for what we have to do is use it for income eligible households in this case. So they don't have to be restricted to our target area. However, the way we're allocating the money, we've prioritized three census tracts that uh, at, for the first phase of this that are in fact all in the CDBG target area. Okay. And so we're trying to, we're still trying to target our money, but basically, we've targeted part of the fifth ward, a large part of the eighth ward, a little bit of the, just the way the census tracts don't match up with wards, a little bit of the um, second and ninth ward are also included. So it's pretty much all the south so, um, from um, the metro tracks uh, along Howard and, and between Howard and Oakton, west to the west side of town, then up the west side, um, roughly on Dodge, but not exactly, um, to about Maine, and then um, from uh, Church Street um, east to, uh, from the canal to uh, Green Bay, and then up to where um, the canal and Green Bay Road meet, um, so the heart of the Fifth Ward. So we really are prioritizing um, 
our lowest income areas, even if HUD doesn't, didn't make us do it. <laughs> And we're, we're prioritizing small landlords too, right? Yes. In the first phase, it's, it's just in those census tracts where there are more small landlords. But if we move to second phase, then it will specifically um, prioritize small local landlords. Yes. We just don't know if we'll have enough money to um, uh, get to that second phase. I, I just want to give you a real quick update because... Um, uh, if I can find it, it was emailed to me by one of my co-workers. Um, but we had, um, we'd gotten 40 um, people had contacted through the city's portal. So that isn't even including to connections directly. Um, we have city staff that are helping um, with this. And we had uh, more than, I think we had 40 people who, who contacted us on the first day. So the demand is definitely there. Yeah. Yes. Right. The demand okay. will outstrip the supply, unfortunately. Okay. So what Ugo, we should move is on. that it? Yep. Anything else? Hugo, anything else? No. Um, all right. So um, let me clarify the um, the agenda. So um, Sarah, would you say this is mostly a staff presentation? I went through this carefully, the packet, and I'm, I'm not certain that there's any um, action on the part of the committee. Is there any, any, um, any approvals or just consensus? Well, it's more consensus, but also, but we do want, we do want to hear the um, <coughs> input from- Oh yes, but I mean, there's no, um, no uh, motions to approve. Correct, sentences. correct. It, it doesn't require action. And we That's also, I mean. we didn't want to, formal action. We also didn't do things like put in approval of minutes because we didn't want to have separate, because then we would have to convene each body separately to approve its minutes. And, and that didn't seem like the best use of everybody's time, so. Well, I, I realize about the minutes, but I wanted to make certain that I didn't miss anything within the packet that required a formal uh, motion or action to the council. Right. Okay, all right, good. All right, so um, the first item is allocation process for um, mental health board, CDBG, public services funds, et cetera. And um, who's going to take on that presentation? So Jessica's gonna kick this off. We're gonna pull up slides for you and uh, and bear with me, hopefully everyone can see and, and hear. Um, so yes, thank you, Alderman Rainey. This joint meeting of the Housing and Community Development Act Committee and Mental Health Board is to update everyone on the new unified process for allocating city funding, um, both Mental Health Board and CDBG, uh, to provide services needed by Evanston residents that the city doesn't provide or doesn't meet the, meet the total need for in our community. Um, okay, it's one of the actions being taken to address systemic inequities and in access to services that impact some residents. So this is how we got here. Um, this bicycle inspired vision of inequalities where everyone gets the same bike that doesn't take their unique needs into account uh, does provide a visual representation of how we hope to move from providing equal services to maybe providing more equitable services. Um, the goal of the restructure is to make service delivery more equitable for underserved populations impacted by systemic discriminatory practices, and now also those most affected by COVID-19 to give those residents the support they need in a timely and cost-effective way. Um, so this started with our social services core committee. Uh, the remaining steps in the social service core committee recommendation was to align funding for external agencies, uh, CDBG public services and mental health board uh, to the same purpose, to provide equitable opportunity to residents who face systemic barriers. Jessica. Yes. <clears throat> would you mind if people asked you questions while you were presenting or would you rather wait and not be interrupted. Um, I, I can 
Can, can we hold questions until the end? I'm yes. so sorry. I don't want people to lose no, questions. No. And you know, thank you for bringing that up because people can type questions into the question box and then uh, staff can address them. Perfect. Sorry to interrupt. Also. I wanted to know before you got into it. Thank good you. Question. I appreciate that. That's good. Um, okay. So the Social Services Core Committee, uh, the city, city staff has sought input from community partners as represented uh, in this slide. And some of them are here tonight. So that's great. Um, these partners also serve uh, many of the same underserved populations uh, as indicated by their responses in our community needs assessment survey. Um, and we put that out in the summer and fall of 2019 as part of our 2020-2024 consolidated plan. Um, we know that agencies, oops, sorry. We know that agencies can't provide for all of the needs of our clients, um, but either through referral or um, in our community. Um, but because they are working with such complex populations. Um, but agencies do uh, refer to, to other agencies and they track those referrals. So agencies are doing the best that they can. Um, in spite of this, 65% of the agencies responding through our community needs assessment survey also told us that clients who are eligible for services were not able to access them. So, we have to ask ourselves, why? Why is this happening? Um, the single biggest barrier uh, to accessing services was the lack of financial resources, um, combined with unstable housing, no health insurance, and the inability to afford childcare or not having education or training for higher jobs. Um, the people with complex needs and fewest resources also can't navigate our fragmented system to get the resources. And this was pre-COVID, uh, <laughs> but COVID-19 we know has had a tremendous impact on our already vulnerable populations. Um, so it's heightened the need for an equity lens. Uh, over three times as many black respondents than white respondents uh, report that they are not sure that they can meet average household expenses. Um, and over twice as many Latina, Latinx households as white households are finding it difficult to pay for basic households needs. This is according to the US Census Pulse Survey from December, 2020. So the new process would target services to people with the greatest needs using an equity lens. And this was presented and endorsed by Rules Committee in October of 2020. So how will this restructure help? Um, the goal is to provide robust case management services for individuals and families with complex multifaceted needs. Um, these services would be funded using grants. Uh, support services identified by people working with their case managers would be accessed rapidly even if the client doesn't have insurance or doesn't meet CCAP requirements for funding assistance, um, that these services would be provided and paid for on a fee-for-service basis. Um, we're also looking at safety net services, like providing food to people unable to afford it or who can't shop and prepare meals, um, domestic violence services, emergency shelter, street outreach, and drop-in services would also be grant-funded. Um, these services meet the immediate needs um, and work to connect clients with case management for deeper services as appropriate. Okay, so we're going to focus first on case management. Uh, funding would get more people into robust case management plans and create the capacity on the, on the side of the agencies to serve more individuals and families. Um, case managers are known for developing a holistic case management plan um, and meet, meeting regularly with the participants they work with to assess progress towards these goals. Goals could include um, increased income to maintain stable housing or getting training to qualify for higher wage jobs 
or even getting childcare. Um, children's outcomes would also be tracked, uh, physical and emotional health, school attendance, or through you know, grade achievement or attainment. The relationships, the case management relationships we recognize can be multiple year or short, depending on the household's challenges to achieving self-sufficiency. But success is dependent on clients having timely access to support services. So we know that our fragment system puts the burden of locating services on people with the greatest needs and the fewest resources. The most equitable and efficient way to fix this is to pay for those support services in case management plans with fee for service agreements or, or procurement. This removes that barrier of the inability to pay or you know, it provides help navigating the system. Um, it's also essential that we maintain safety net services, including homeless shelters, street outreach and drop-in programs, food programs, um, services to people experiencing domestic violence. Um, these services are also critical for connecting at-risk residents and engaging them in case management or other needed services. So like healthy food for an out-of-work parent who can't afford groceries and pay rent, um, so these services are temporary but vital, um, but they can also like a DV shelter um, that helps someone, you know, flee, fleeing an abuser, um, the person involved in services might need a temporary alternative um, to returning to the abuser and would move into case management to achieve that goal. Okay, so this is a visual representation of our funding categories and how they interact with case management at the center um, and linking clients to support services um, that would also be, you know, funded. Um, and then safety net services providing those additional supports. So staff met with 35 agency representatives from 18 different agencies over the course of two uh, virtual meetings to go over this new application structure. We went through the similar presentation, uh, similar to the one we're going through tonight, uh, followed by a question and answer session and discussion. And this is some of the input that we've received. There was a robust and interactive discussion at each meeting. Um, we used Jamboards, which is a visual whiteboard uh, that lets people comment anonymously. So the most frequent question was, how does my agency fit? Uh, what category do we fall under? So this isn't something that staff is going to dictate. Uh, instead, we are going to, the agencies are gonna make those choices and um, we're gonna have smaller group discussions and one-on-one -on -one conversations with agencies to support them through this application process. Um, the second biggest question was how, how are payments gonna work? Um, and how does this affect program reporting and measurements? So these are all good questions <laughs> and it's important to you know, include this information in the application, which we hope to present to agencies um, and again, sort of work, work with the agencies so that everybody has a clear understanding of the process. Um, we do have standards for case management services, including um, a measurement of progress toward goals. And these goals can be housing stability, living wage jobs um, and improved health and well-being. So what are next steps? As we mentioned, we will have follow-up meetings with agencies uh, and we're preparing the Zoom grads applications for case management and safety net services. There will be more discussion on support services, um, including identifying key services and working out payment schedules and, and processes for that. Uh, our timeline is to finalize agreements for case management and safety net services by June which we recognize is um, ambitious. <laughs> um, and, and then we can identify support services and a payment system for those services. So, so how does this impact our allocation process is the next question. Well, oops. 
it's different from what we have done in the past. Um, we have had, um, you know, well, case management and safety net, well, first let me, case management and safety net services will be grant funded. And we, we're recommending using a combination of CDBG and mental health board dollars. Um, part of that is there's a cash flow reason. Um, agencies that are funded entirely through CDBG, even when we say you're starting your work um, on an estimated grant amount at the beginning of the year, and we don't know quite when we're going to be able to give you money, we frequently end up giving them all their money in the um, latter half of the year, sometimes in a single payment because of when we get our money from HUD. Um, that puts stresses on agencies. And let me tell you, if they use um, cash accounting versus grant-based account I mean, versus um, accrual accounting, and they have a July 1st fiscal year, it also leaves them with a problem of they haven't received any funding um, at, in the January through June period, then they, they can't, if you're um, using cash accounting, you can't apply any of the funding to that period of time. So it also can mess with their budgets. Um, I think the cash flow part is probably even more important, but both parts can be a problem. Um, support services would be funded the, the, by mental health board because it's infeasible to use CDBG on either um, a, on a fee for services basis or um, uh, procurement, you can do competitive procurement with CDBG or you can use grant agreements. But if you do competitive procurement, you have to open it to the world, nonprofits and for-profits, basically whoever, we can't limit the competition. So what happens is we could wind up um, then you're, you know, basically dealing with the lowest responsive and responsible bid for services that we don't really, I just don't think it would work. <laughs> just put it that way. Um, uh, so we've combined, agencies are applying by category. So they're not applying by funding source because of the way we have to use the funding sources to make this um, process work. And we can't really have separate, a separate mental health board review and a separate Housing and Community Development Act committee review that staff then tries to combine or something to figure out who to fund and at how much. So um, we're going to need to have a cross board and um, committee um, group to deal with the services funding, or perhaps it should be um, a committee of the whole. That's something that I think is very much up to the um, board and the committee to discuss and, and see, see what they think about. It doesn't have to be decided at this meeting necessarily either. But that I think, uh, you know, it's, it's really critical. Um, and it's really the only way we can effectively make decisions that will move the process forward and, and focus the resources on people of greatest needs and um, implement this new process. Um, now, we are working on developing an estimated dollar amount that might work for each category, but quite frankly, um, I don't believe that that should be fixed. I think even if we recommend one, and what I would like to be able to do is develop a recommendation to bring to you in March um, before, we, before we actually you know, are in the allocation process so that everybody has that um, to frame. Um, we should get our CDBG grant amount um, by early next week, maybe even on Monday, which will allow us to have a better idea of, I mean, then we'll know how much CDBG we're gonna have, which will allow us to do that more effectively. Um, and um, I think that there has to be some flexibility um, how, even if we do an estimate for each category, um, how um, the board and committee might want to actually allocate it based on the applications that we receive. Um, we also will have a better idea by our um, March meeting um, from talking to agencies how they're planning to apply, which will help us do a better job. If we were to do it right now, Jessica and I would be estimating what different agencies 
would apply for, we think. And, and frankly, one of our discussions uh, was, well, can I apply in the category that, or for a program that I have, that our agency hasn't applied for in the past that we think fits your, this um, process more effectively? Yes, and we also have told agencies that if they want to apply in more than one category, they can, just as they've always been allowed to apply for more than one program or service in the past uh, process to either mental health or CDBG. So um, we may come up with, um, we had one question, for example, can we do joint presentation, uh, joint requests? Um, and that would perhaps link case management with some supportive services from a single provider that they would give us, pro propose a different, um, uh, you know, a joint um, application for. Um, I really think we ought to look at all the ideas that our agencies have because many of them work very closely and that could be um, a very efficient and effective system to have a, a formalized referral process for certain clients that would get them into those so supportive services that we're talking about. So there still are quite a few unknowns and I don't necessarily think we're going to get everything perfect by a long way in a first year, especially in a year that's as challenging to everybody as this one because everybody's still reeling from COVID-19 and still trying to deal with um, the that additional factor. But um, as you could see from all of the statistics, the, the need to really focus our funding to help these um, residents who are of greatest need, I think is huge. And um, if we don't start now, we'll, it'll be much harder to start changing later on. I think that the urgency is there based on the need and what's happening in our community and to facilitate recovery from COVID-19 for on an equitable basis. Okay. Any questions or what are your questions? I think is probably what I should say. Do we look in the chat? Yes, we'll look in the chat first. Um, there are no the, questions in the chat. Right. The, I put the, one in. Uh -huh. The core committee was the social services core committee that it was the staff, um, cross-departmental staff group that um, developed recommendations on how to improve um, the city's delivery of services on an equitable basis. Um, it was headed up by Kimberly Richardson um, with um, Kathleen, I can't think of her name, um, uh, a, um, the, she's the same person who is helping guide our equity uh, work right now. Uh, she works, she's at UIC. Um, and it involved um, people from who at the time were in parks, recreation and community services, the youth and young adults um, group. It included um, Audrey Washington's group, at the, which was also in um, parks, recreation and community services at that time, the senior programs, uh, as well as um, um, our human services staff that were in the health and human services department. It, it, it moved everybody into that um, single department. So under one sort of umbrella to better coordinate services. So that was the first step. And then the, this is the next step, which is to continue that and expand that to the way we give out funding to external agencies. Well, that was my question. Then I had another question. Um, under the allocation process, mm -hmm. um, the last bullet point says condition the release of payments and continued funding on the achievement of specified outcomes. Would you really do that? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not history. saying that it would be absolutely, um, if you said you were, you hope to have X people do this, it has to be we have to see progress and we have to see tracking. Um, it's very difficult to say, you know, I mean, many times I'll see, we'll see goals like 80% of people or 
families in case management might achieve one or more goals, that sort of thing. It's not, it's not a hard and fast that they absolutely, it's not gonna be like all the children will advance to the next grade, not that kind of measure, but it really is, the, the goal is to be specific so that we can see progress and measure progress. And if the agencies aren't measuring progress that way, then we, we you know, it's really not gonna allow us to evaluate how the program is working. I saw that Becky had a question. I don't know if it was. Yeah. Do you see that? Um, I can it's see gone it. now. It's gone now. I don't know. So oh. Becky asked uh, if we could give an example of a family with complex needs using this new model of care. Um, an initial referral for need? Just That's an example. Um, what? Looking for Lola? Yeah. She's sure. in the, um, the um, well, one example is um, a, a family um, who currently the, the wage earner or earners are not making enough money to have stable housing and they're working multiple jobs. Um, they may have and they have children who they can't afford childcare for, but they haven't been able to access um, uh, funding for childcare, uh, or it may be something like they they can't find childcare services that are uh, at the time of day they need that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. It can just be any number of things like that where it's um, to to. Um, an example that we've used in the past is that the, the households that are um, frequently or, or in our TIBRA program generally have um, multiple needs that are unmet. Um, the driver of it is they simply don't have enough money and resources to get those needs um, so that the individual needs can be obviously different among them. Does that no, no, not quite. Okay. Um, um, because that's my experience is most people have complex needs. It's never one simple thing or right. one service needed. So right. in the, that example that you gave, will there be, I mean, that sounds like based upon what I'm understanding the new formula is based upon her, that family's need would be child care, job creation, um, et cetera. So is that going to come from two different providers? Or is that case manager going to be one person who makes the linkages to these other providers? I'm, I'm not capturing that. The that. idea is the case manager will be making linkages and actually being able to, um, you know, send, get the, the services um, in, um, let me try another example. Um, okay. We have situations where people need some kind of health care. It can be mental health, it can be physical health, it can be everything, but um, mental health is, is one of the most common ones. Um, they can't get into mental health services oftentimes very rapidly because they don't have um, uh, insurance right. or any other way of payment. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things is we would like to be able to say, and, and this is, we, we discussed what the fee schedule would be right. um, with agencies, but be able to start somebody in services, paying for it, and then the case managers who usually work to try to get them onto insurance or whatever to sustain that. Um, similar things could work with childcare, where a short-term subsidy can sometimes help um, when you have a family where uh, isn't eligible for CCAP because the uh, for eligibility for that you either have to be in school full time or working. And mm -hmm. if somebody's looking for a job and has children, but could get um, a maybe a three month period of time where they get a scholarship so they can find a job and get established and then transition to CCAP is another idea of how this could work. Okay. I think this will be a, 
I'll learn, understand this a little more as we go, because I just don't know then who that, that family would be, the different providers. Would they mm -hmm. be working with all those different providers? Um, would they be working with a child care center? Would they be working with um, the job training or whatever? Do you understand? Like, are they going to still be? Right. But they could be um, because in many cases, case managers are already referring them to get other services, but they don't, but they may need either um, some money to get into some of those services or they may okay. um, find that a program is full and how can they go to another one? They just go all over the, you know, they get I routed around. So part of it is to set up referrals that are um, organized in advance, shall we say, to try to get people into services. And if okay. payment okay. starting okay. that off helps that happen is the goal. I see, I see. Does that okay. make sense? I'm sorry, I it is complicated to explain. <laughs> I think I'm getting it. It's really just, it's providing the resources to the, for based upon the client's needs directly to the different agencies. So the yes. resources kind of follow the client. Right, right. It it's also different. gives us a better way of tracking outcomes from the resources right now uh, and making sure they're getting to as I say, the people that we've defined as needing more boxes uh -huh. or a different bicycle. Uh -huh. um, and that's the, that's the trying to yes. navigate the system. Yes. Like I, I know as being on the mental health board where Trilogy, you know, or Connections will make many referrals to Trilogy, but then it stops. <laughs> um, right. The client doesn't quite make it to Trilogy, Trilogy even though they've been referred. So right this time there'll be some resources or more support right. to ensure, right. I think that's okay. Yes. And There's, sometimes they're just put in a list or in a holding pattern yes. until yes. somebody gets them into some level of insurance that can then compensate yes, exactly. that. And that is a huge challenge, we know. Yes, yes, okay. In the, chat, in the chat, there is a question about what services are available for non-US citizens. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the good things about CDBG when you work with external agencies is there is a don't ask, don't tell. They don't have to um, require um, <laughs> checking citizenship or legal status in this country, which we actually have to do if the city implements its, its own programs. Um, um, so that the services are really open to people who are not citizens. Because mental health board funding, I mean, locally, we've never put a, that restriction mm -hmm. um, on the use of mental health board funds either. But it, by um, giving our CDBG to agencies, we allow them that same flexibility. So we, that's, we don't screen for that. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, the, the question is here, do you know any place where there is a restriction? Um, well, um, we can't give our own GA and EA to um, certain undocumented people, which is why we set up that separate fund um, at the city to try to do that, you know, that's an example. Mm-hmm. And there are other programs that um, have restrictions too. I don't honestly know all of them, um, but it's an ongoing challenge um, to figure it out. And the other thing is if you can do some things, but you can't do all things through a single program or channel, it becomes a real pain too. Um, housing, for example, is sometimes something that get, uh, gets um, hung up um, on um, um, citizenship or legal status requirement. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that again, well, that's one of the reasons our rent assistance program is being implemented by Connections for the Homeless. Again, then they don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. If you're a governmental entity, you're held to a different standard when you're using your CDBG. I mean, it's really an annoying thing, frankly. Mm -hmm. 
Good to know. Okay. Hugo so has a question. Yes, I do. And it's a follow up on the US citizen, non US citizen question. Um, is there anything that the city of Evanston can do to become more embracing of people that are uh, non US citizens right now and be more open to promote that we don't ask? that uh, it, it, it's like, don't ask, don't tell. It's like, shh, don't say it. And, you know, people that have no documentation are in fear. They see a, a, a police car turning the corner and their legs start shaking. So, mm -hmm. it, it, and, and, and I, th I think that maybe the, the, the city of Evanston could become a true sanctuary uh, for non-U.S. citizens. I know that we use that term, but uh, if we are sh about it, are, are we really giving the right message with that? Well, uh, maybe that wasn't the best comparison. We, I mean, we don't really, we, 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 don't, we don't ask, um, or at least when we're doing our services through our non-profits, um, um, if, if we're doing general assistance, my understanding is that, that then we are required to, to ask that. We don't have a choice because that's a requirement of general assistance. So um, the, the challenge is how to convince people who have been frankly intimidated and made to believe that everybody is out really not open to helping them um, by some recent well, the policies of about the last four years, let's face it. Um, we had the same problem with the census and everything else. I think it's just going to continue to take time, but we are working with as many different people as we can. Um, I know you were help, offered to help the census a number of times and I couldn't connect and get you as involved as I would like, but we work with Stephanie Mendoza and the um, Latino Outreach, um, uh, Latino, resources, um, whatever the name of that nonprofit is, is one of the groups that we're working with. Um, and we're gonna just continue to do that. Um, the challenge is how to overcome ingrained fears that, that have been fostered uh, over a long period of time. I don't have the authority to recommend that we become a sanctuary city. Um, we are a welcoming city. And I think that that's a little above my pay scale to determine if we're gonna do more than that. <laughs> So, Alderman Braithwaite. Sarah, thank you. I'll just be real brief. Hello, Mr. Rodriguez. We haven't had a chance to meet. Um, there is, and I, I apologize, I'm listening on two meetings at the same time. Sarah, can you please uh, put my number in, Mr. Rodriguez, so we can get in touch? So there is a immigrant community that, uh, did you already talk about, that's meeting on a weekly basis? I can get you plugged into that. In the past, we've had meetings at St. Mary's Church where we've brought mm -hmm. together a number of the elected officials along with Spanish-speaking police officers just to explain, you know, what their role is in terms of law enforcement. They do not. I don't think anyone that you could come up with has ever been arrested and turned into ICE by our City of Evanston Police Department. Mm -hmm. So I hear and understand the concern, and I'd love to talk to you outside of the meeting just so you can be an ambassador for all the wonderful things that we are doing, particularly for the Spanish speaking community. So yeah, Sarah's yeah, gonna put yeah, my yeah. number in there and we can talk in the next couple of days, fair enough? I'll just fair send enough. it to Hugo so it's Sorry to not out the in meeting. the chat. Alderman Wilson. Go Thank you. Thank you. And, and I think we kind of covered it a bit, but we, you know, the city council did pass um, uh, a sanctuary Sydney uh, provision and policy. And not only that, but once we kind of looked at that more closely, we made some amendments to that to clarify uh, and make it even stronger that we don't stop people without, you know, a warrant or, or you know, specifically probable cause. Um, so we, you know, have tried to do that. And in addition, we also, uh, the Attorney General, United States Attorney General made some threats as far as uh, possibly withholding funding from cities like Evanston because of our policy. And we took a very strong position on that. And we were actually the lead plaintiff in suing Jeff Sessions, who was the attorney general at the time. So we filed a lawsuit to challenge that and fight back against that. And we won that lawsuit uh, together with a coalition of other, other cities. So um, 
you know, I, I, Peter, you know, kind of covered that. So it's important to try to get that word out in the community that we do have this strong position to be supportive and, uh, and we are willing to fight for, for those rights of, of individuals in our community who, you know, otherwise might feel threatened. Okay. Um, another thing that was in the chat was um, desperate need for more street outreach, especially for the homeless. And I don't know, as far as I can see, nobody's doing that in the areas that I'm on the street in. So I, I hope there's some special attention to be paid to that. I think that's just, there's just such a crying need. And I think that we're going to see different needs or our, our, our balance of needs is going to be different for this year and probably next as we're, you know, seeing how we come out of COVID-19 because you're right, it has, we've had, a huge increase in our homeless population that is, um, and more problems with how they can be served. Um, um, and Tina pointed out, we, you know, I mean, just by asking how many people are still in hotels, we can't get people out of um, the um, uh, um, shelter into permanent housing uh, fast enough for uh, complex reasons too. But that's a good point, Alderman Rainey, thank you. Um, I see there's another question in, the chat about changing this model to focus on persons with complex needs, not the agency, makes me wonder if as many persons will be served. Thoughts and will um, some persons currently served lose service? Um, I don't, it, it isn't the intent of the process for um, anyone to lose services. Um, it will depend partly on how agencies respond um, and how they, you know, how, because most agencies serve way more people than are served only with our money already um, for multiple programs. So um, we are going to be focusing our money on certain or on fewer people so that we can actually take care of their multiple needs and hopefully move them to um, self sustaining and um, fulfilling lives um, in a way that we haven't been succeeding at. So I think we're going to count fewer people, but one of the other challenges is right now, every agency responds with how many people they serve through a specific program. And we have no way of deduplicating if the same person is going getting multiple services. And in some cases, I'm sure they are. So you know, it's, we will probably be counting fewer people as served specifically by the funded activities, but there will be greater depth of service, which is something that we um, talk about sometimes when we're trying to evaluate programs. You know, if somebody does a one-time meeting with somebody versus works with them for a year to help them improve their overall situation, um, you know, we're going to count more people for one-time assistance, but that doesn't mean we're really moving the needle and making, really fixing people's situation because we're not really counting the other things that they may be getting and being able to um, attribute the um, progress to the programming that they're receiving or not. We, they're, you know, we just know that somebody got one touch point. Does that answer that? Okay. Um, any more questions from the various, the two committees? All right. Um, Sarah, do you have, what's your next step? Well, our next step is we are going to be meeting with uh, agencies, as we said. We're going to be um, designing the Zoom grant application. We don't know if it's gonna be a single one that's gonna branch or if it will be two separate Zoom grants applications, one for case management and one for um, uh, uh, the safety net services. Um, but we will prepare that. Our goal is to open that application uh, before the end of um, March. 
and then be able to hopefully move quickly to get, you know, because agencies have, um, are learning about this process. So they're already thinking about what they're going to apply for so that we can get applications to the board and the committee for review. I do think that um, we are our normal um, CDBG committee meeting would be um, on the 16th of March, which is conveniently with the, our 128 day month that keeps it the same uh, day. And if we could have a um, joint meeting, then we would take everybody through where we are on everything and also um, hopefully uh, get agreement on how to structure the uh, allocation review committee or the application review and allocation committee. That's also the meeting to review our uh, caper. Oh yes, public we have to have a public caper. We have to have the public comment period for the 2020 caper end. So, <laughs> hey Sarah, a quick question for you: How many agencies do you expect will apply? Um, I mean, from from our meeting, it seemed like every agency. We didn't get absolutely all agencies didn't send representatives, but. Um, everybody seemed interested in applying. So I think we're gonna have roughly the same number of agencies, which I think is about 20. Um, some agencies have multiple programs. So what happens is in my head, I'm trying to figure out how many subrecipient or grant agreements we did. And sometimes, you know, um, a single agency will have multiple um, uh, programs. So. That doesn't, I can't de dupe in my head fast enough. Um, one of the things we also um, think may happen is some agencies may uh, ask for funding for other service, for certain services they provide that aren't the ones that they've always been funded for in the past based on, on that. Thank you. Sandy, do you have a question? Sandy Johnson? Yes, my question is, um, after this joint meeting in March, the end of March and the questioning, when do you anticipate that the uh, applications will be circulated or available? Well, those will be, we want to open by um, the end of March. The applications? formal applications. We're going to be talking to people a lot and we may have a draft that we're going to be circulating with them ahead of time. So within 40 days maybe or whatever, mm -hmm. the applications will be ready. Mm -hmm. And um, we said it's a tight schedule. We know we're. <laughs> and um, then they would have what, uh, would it be about a month to apply? or whatever? We, what we have, usually we've given, um, well, usually we have a two-step process. We have the a letter of intent, and I don't think we'll do that two-step process. We'll just open the applications. I don't think we'll need necessarily a two-step process because um, we're going to be talking with agencies and we'll be getting an idea of what we think they're going to be applying for, which is really what that um, letter of intent was designed to do, try to figure out so we could figure out how to structure the um, hearing meetings where we, you know, where the board and the committee could hear from the agencies and ask questions. So, um, you know, our, our goal is, as we say, to get applications in and do re the review meetings. Um, well, probably would be the very end of April um, and then um, possibly into May and then get the uh, funding recommendations that can be taken to city council, um, ideally before the end of May, the la probably the last council meeting in May, and get um, grant agreements uh, and everything up and running in um, June. Really? So it would be for the um, basically July 1st that the funding would be available? Um, Yes, um, but we also, depending on um, how organizations apply and if they're applying for something that they are already doing and can track, we 
can with CDBG technically we can make funding retroactive to the start of our fiscal year. Um, and one of the things we're hearing from agencies is um, if they can, if some of the, uh, well, I'll use an example of, of somebody who's already doing case management. Now we want to be able to get new people into case management, but we also know that they're already working with people who meet the, the description of the, of the individuals and households we're trying, we, we are seeking to help. So it's possible that we can consider whether or not they can put some of their funding back to the pre-time, but that's more an accounting thing. Um, do you know what I'm saying? It's to try to help um, deal with their um, fiscal years and things like that. It, it doesn't, um, you know, we, we can't, I guess the, the ones that are easiest to potentially say could put funding back um, to an earlier point and could be more easily counted, um, which we did like in 2020, we did that for actually all our agencies with both mental health board funding and CDBG because of the, um, all of our timing of funding release was delayed in 2020. And we were able to do that could possibly be done with say safety net services, which are much more likely to be very similar to the, uh, to the services that some, uh, uh, programs that some of the agencies are being funded for. So I, I guess I missed something. Were the agencies funded as of um, last, you know, we missed out on several months or at least we hadn't met. So did agencies receive funding? They did for 2020. 2020 yes. Nobody has received official funding for 2021. Okay. So you based it on um, the previous year's recommendations. The 2020. No, so no, no. 2020, 2020 allocations were made by the committee and the board. Yeah, right, and, right. And, well, and they those made were that all... in 19. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Got it. Right. And all those were released. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I know it's really hard um, to even remember what fiscal year we're in sometimes. I mean, <laughs> that's what I'm finding. We keep saying last year. Oh no, last year was 2020, not 2019. You know, that it, I feel like we missed a, a year almost in some cases. Okay, where are we right now? Do um, you want to move out of this and go into any kind of staff report you might have? Are we finished with the new changes? We are finished unless there are any other questions. And we actually um, already talked about the thing that I would have just provided a brief staff update on, which was the, um, the rent assistance program. So okay. Okay. anybody, last call, anybody have any other questions? I'm really interested in this, um, on the, the street service, just really interested, just, it, it, I, I think our issues are getting worse and worse and more serious. I mean, I'm getting very concerned that we're going to start finding um, bodies on our street. And that that is going to be just a horrific situation. Just, just I mean, devastating. And, you know, there's, there's nothing that an individual can really do. We can call the police. We can call connections. Um, but there needs to be intervention before we're at that point. And, um, you know, it's just, I, I just, I mean, in the south end of town, it's getting very serious. And there's just nothing, you know, people are knocking on doors now um, saying they need a place to sleep. And there's no place to sleep. So... And I know we're talking about a shelter, but um, very serious. So, okay, so um, uh, shall we entertain a motion to adjourn? I hate to leave all you beautiful people, but um, if we have no further business, I will entertain that. Yeah, we'll Move adjourn. Okay. Is there a second? second? Second. All right. Thank you, staff. It was an excellent, excellent uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And, and the work accomplished to 
get to this point is uh, very intense and we appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mental Health Board. Do we need a, a roll call vote? Yes, for... we do. Yes, we do. But I'm just making a few. Do comments. we need it for to adjourn? I no. thought we did. No. Oh, well, let's do it. it it's better we, to be safe do than sorry. Yeah. Okay. Do. Better safe than sorry. Alderman Ramey. Aye. Eric. Aye. Irene. Irene? Aye. Thank you. Ugo? Aye. Uh, I'm Archana. Uh, I Aye. always mess up your name. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Sue. <laughs> Aye. Thank you. Alderman Wynn. Aye. Sandy Johnson. Aye. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Aye. And Becky Filer. Aye. And I promise I will get your name right. Now I've got a complete mental block about it. So <laughs> thank you so much. I think I got everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Right. Thanks, no, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Bye.